My guest today is Tim Riley. Tim, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks, David. What do you do, Tim? So I work with Microsoft's uh, Commercial Software Engineering Group. Well, no way. That's Just like I you, work. yeah. Yeah, yeah we, work, we work uh on very similar planes, I think is I a good way to describe that. I actually do that. that. I am surprised, but I know it. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and we get to help companies uh, build awesome stuff on Azure. It's, it's a really cool job. It's a fun job, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a confession to make. Yep. I don't know anything about blockchain. That's okay. Can you help me out? <laughs> yeah, I can help you out. Yeah, because I know you've been speaking a lot about blockchain, and I know you've been working with customers on blockchain projects. Um, so I, my first question is, what is blockchain? Yeah. So blockchain is uh, basically a protocol for computers to communicate with each other. Um, I think people get confused thinking it's actually some physical blocks in some location. It's physical chains too, probably. Yeah, physical chains connected to each other. Um, but really, it's a way of computers for organizing information among each other. Okay. Uh, can you describe what this uh, organization looks like? Yeah. Um, so I, I just give, gave a presentation about this, so it's very fresh. Good. Um, so there's I'm sorry I missed that. I was, oh, it's, I was it's actually good. doing another interview in this room. Oh, good, good, yeah. Um, it's actually really an honor to be on this this uh, this video cast. It's I love I love watching the, your your videos. So it's cool. To, it's so. cool. It's cool <laughs> to be here. Um, so there's kind of seven things that kind of become the blockchain. And if if your software system is able to do these seven things, it's probably a blockchain like system. Um, the first one is a peer to peer networking environment. Okay. So the computers are able to talk to each other. All right. Like Windows for work groups. Yeah. Are oh, you too young? To <laughs> I don't that. get that. <laughs> no, more like BitTorrent or um, oh, okay. or yeah. like a mesh network. Got it. Um, some kind of protocol so everyone can communicate with each mm -hmm. other and share information. No, no client server model. Right. Um, second is we need a form of consensus. So we need to determine uh, the current state of the rest of the system. Oh yeah, that's harder to do if you don't have a, a master server. Yeah, right. So in Ethereum, they use something called Paxos, and Paxos is is a is just simply is like a leadership and majority model, where we collect a bunch of information and somebody is decide to be the leader, and they say, "Does everybody agree?" And if the more majority of the people agree, that's the kind of the state we take. Oh, I'm sorry, what's Ethereum? Ethereum Ethereum is a, sep a different implementation of the blockchain. Okay, so it's it's very similar to um, Bitcoin's blockchain, okay. uh, but I've, I've just been kind of focused on Ethereum recently. Okay, so there are multiple implementations of blockchain, uh, which is an Dis algorithm or distributed a ledger technology. Okay, and yeah. uh, Ethereum is one of those. All right. Okay. Yeah, correct. Um, the third thing is we need a uh, uh, basically a state machine to keep track of all of this consensus that's happening. Okay. So every time we have a, a message that's received, or I guess I guess I should do the fourth one, uh, or the third one will be like messages. So we need a way of interpreting, collecting all this information in the form of messages. And I like to think of this as just like a cash register. Like at some point, somebody put in some information, and it becomes a transaction. Hmm. What's an example of a message? Like add a dollar, reduce okay. a dollar. Okay. Um, so all these messages come in the form of transactions. Mm -hmm. And then we need to use that consensus and those messages to build a state machine. Hmm. So that's the fourth one. So I kind of went out of order there. All right. But a state machine, um, essentially, it keeps track of the state of every element in a system and the history of those states, right? Yeah. So and, and the transition phases between those states. Exactly. Yeah. So we were able to use... We're able to use those messages and that consensus to build a state machine. Okay. Kind of those things together become the state machine. Um, and then fifth, we're looking at a, um, we need to have a system that uh, provides like an open protocol so that others can join. You know, if there's a, a blockchain of just one, it's not very interesting, of one node. Okay. Uh, it's not very interesting. So you need to have a way of other computers talking to each other and defining a protocol that makes that possible. Hmm. Um, then we also need a, um, some type of algorithm that provides a proof of work so that no one party can overtake the system and change the transactions or mm. change the state of the system. Okay. So proof of work, you mean what is considered the valid state at a given time? You know, yeah. The state of record, I guess, is the, is that, that what you mean? Yeah. So the, the way that, the way that the, the blockchain propagates or like continues is, each of the nodes 
kind of post all the transactions that they've seen. Okay. And to determine the next block, they need to bundle up all those transactions. All right. And so use proof of work to figure out the order of all those transactions. All right. So if you ask, what is the answer? And the answer is 73.5. Then that should be unambiguous. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where it's really hard to determine, but really easy to check. Hmm. So you say, there's all these things that's complicated. And they say, oh, this looks like the right answer. And then everybody else can verify it really easily. I see. And the seventh one? And the seventh one is probably the most important of them all, um, at least from kind of a technologist point of view, is, is because you have the state machine that's distributed among all these computers, um, you also have a distributed database. So you can use this distributed ba data ba database to store all sorts of information and access it from any node on the machine, on the, on the blockchain protocol hmm. in the network. Okay, so all those things are required for a system to be a blockchain system. What's um, What do you do with it, and what's the advantage of a blockchain system over other systems? So I think coming back straight to the distributed database, um, in a current client-server model, mm -hmm. we trust that server to keep track of that database, that data, and we, we entrust trust into them, um, even though they might not follow best practices. Um, with the blockchain or other blockchain protocols, the system is secured by the system itself, so if I want to run a transaction or I want to post a message or store something, uh, I can do that using elliptic curve cryptog cryptography, which is a very challenging thing to break. Um, it's said that to the computational power required to reverse something that's encrypted with an ECC key would require all would would basically boil all the water on <laughs> on the earth. Okay. So it becomes really difficult as soon as you put a message in there. You can put it with a private key. If you sign it with a private key, only you will be able to get that information out. Okay. So any information that you want to keep secret, if you put it behind a private key, it's secret. And because it's everywhere, you can access it from any machine as long as you have that private key. Hmm. So, so everybody that's inside of this uh, blockchain, I'll call it a cluster, yeah. they all have that private key? They'll share that private key? Well, each in, in the case of Ethereum, you you basically generate a you have a private key and it associates with a public key. So I it's see. kind so, of like so a, they each have their own private key mm -hmm. and they all share the public key. Well, they each have a, their own they have their own kind of register. I see. So they use the the combination of their public and private key, so they can um, sign information. They can say I verify this. You can check it with a public key, but never actually have to access the private key. Okay, this seems like it's a critical point of that because the the all these um, nodes trust each other. And they trust yeah. each other because of this encryption. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, give me an example of a practical application mm -hmm. of using blockchain. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interesting ways to use blockchain. And, and my specialty has been around building um, with Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And Ethereum kind of unlocks a different, instead of just a distributed ledger, it's also a distributed virtual machine. Mm -hmm. So not only can you store information on it, but you can also uh, store logic on the system. Okay. And I think that is kind of where it gets really exciting from a developer's perspective. Um, there's kind of a notion in, in Ethereum, the Ethereum world, where it's a, it's a developer tool. It's built for developers by developers for development. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit, it's constantly changing, which is a challenge to building with it right now, but. Um, what's, what's changing? The, the way the protocol works. Oh, so the APIs that you're calling are changing. The APIs, you're, you're, the APIs are changing, but also the way that the system is implemented, hmm. um, and which is a, is a pretty big topic in itself. Um, it's, a, it's also changing in that um, a lot of the tools that are built around the system are always in are kind of changing. So okay. right now, it's, everything feels very early. Um, okay. And that's because it is early, right? It's because it is relatively early, yeah. new technology. Re relatively new, nectolo new technology, yeah. Um, with very little documentation and clarification and versioning. So that's part of the fun. Uh, well, give me an example of a project that, you're, that you've worked on yeah. that uses Ethereum. Yeah. So one of the more interesting ones that we've done, um, we had built a project um, of land registry on Ethereum. So we built a contract that basically allows users to associate um, plots of land. Okay. And then we map that using an Azure function to uh, Minecraft. Ah. <laughs> so a Minecraft user, somebody playing in, in this modded server, um, if they wanted to mine in the land, 
they have we would run a check against their ownership of that land on the blockchain and if they didn't own that land it'd be rejected and they wouldn't be able to mine there and they could claim plots of land and they could they could basically try to manipulate their environment but unless they were the permissioned user um, or if they could get verification from the blockchain that they were the u- per- permissioned user, they couldn't mine. Okay, so let me uh, let me back up a little because y- if you describe that problem to me, I wanted to uh, verify ownership or rights of a, a block of land in a Minecraft game. The way that I would have implemented, I'd say, you know what, I'm going to have a database on a server and I have some code that runs, and every time you want to you want to use this, uh, you know, mine on that block of land, call this web service on the server, it'll check in the database and say, oh, well, Tim does have rights to that, return true, and then go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but you're, um, you've are you chosen to do this a different way, in which case there's this, this bunch of nodes, mm-hmm. and they all collectively know whether or not Tim has the rights to that. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's a quick way of looking at it. You could dive in even deeper, and you could say, we deployed a contract for a contract that states ownership and rights of every single plot in the Minecraft server. Okay. So we basically cut it into a hundred by hundred grid. Right. And then we made a, in a, a structured item in a, and basically is like a class that you would develop in C sharp where it's got member variables and functions. Hmm. And we'd say, I want, we'd call the method on the contract, the contract that's deployed on the blockchain, just like you would call into your, your, you know, in your C-sharp console app, whether or not something ex- is okay. in the database. Yep. Um, you could just ask, do I own this land? And you would get a response back from the contract. Ah. So as long as the environment you're working in can talk to the blockchain, you're able to write an application. There's no database layer. There's no server layer. It's kind mm-hmm. of all together in one. Okay. Uh, you say things like function and that uh, this talks to this part of the system. Is this code that you're writing? Mm-hmm. In what language are you writing that code? We're writing in Solidity. So what's that? Solidity is a is looks like JavaScript or Java kind of, or it's it's uh, it's a new language that was written um, to build software on the blockchain and. It's got some unique properties. It's very early. Um, you have to work around because imagine if you could write code. There's kind of the, the what's the Turing completeness and the non-deterministic factor. Rather, you can't really tell if a software is going to finish running while it's still running. Type mm. of thing. Right? Okay. Th- that problem. Um, that's a real problem in in this this Ethereum world, right? So you need to write code so that it has to stop running at some point, or else you'll you'll use up all the resources of all the computers in the node cluster because hmm. they're constantly computing together. If somebody decides to run in an infinite loop, it would break everything for everyone else. Hmm. So Ethereum in- introduces this idea of gas and the gas is kind of like the fuel to run your program. So if I want to run a transaction, I need to give my transaction a certain value of gas. So I actually have to pay to have something and transact it on the blockchain. Hmm. And so the, the programming language is kind of built around this idea. And so it, it makes certain constraints to reduce the amount of energy is required to do things. So you're a little bit restricted in what you can build, but you can still in, introduce a lot of logic into mm. the system. Is Solidity uh, specific to Ethereum? Yeah. Okay, so mm-hmm. it's their language that uh, to implement blockchain solutions in Ethereum. Yeah. Um, and then I, I so often I hear blockchain and Bitcoin together. What's the relationship there? Yeah. So um, if you can imagine that all of you have this blockchain with all of these in all this information on it. Right. And if you could put any you could you, you need to store some form of information and in the current in the system of blockchain in, in the system of Bitcoin, you're saying that the information we're going to store is how much money is associated with each account and with each private, with each public key. Okay. So it's kind of just like a giant list of wallets, hmm. like a big giant list of how much money everybody has. And every, t- every time you make a tr- transaction or, or move money from one account to another, that's what gets written onto the blockchain. Oh, okay, so everybody collectively agrees how much everybody else has. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. Right. As so opposed to having a, a central server or even a central bank to, to monitor that. Yeah, so there's systems in place 
for large financial institutions that do the same thing, right? At the end of the day, they have to double check where all their money is. Right. And the Bitcoin is, blockchain and Bitcoin are doing that constantly. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is good stuff. I feel like now that I've spoken with you for a few minutes, I know everything there is to know. Yeah. About blockchain. Oh, good. <laughs> that was super effective. <laughs> that, that might be a slight <laughs> exaggeration, actually. I, mean, I think no. this is actually this. I think is a good foundation. I feel like I know more than I did a uh, half an hour ago. Yeah. Um, where Where would I go? Or where would our viewers go if they want to learn more about blockchain? Um, there's some really great resources available. Um, I think if you're just interested in that from a technologist's point of view, there's some really great, the white paper is a really great place to start. The, the, the white paper and the white, yellow paper, I can't remember which one's which, but there's one for each for blockchain and for Ethereum. Oh, where is that? Um, I'm pretty sure they're both on GitHub or you can find them from the GitHub. Okay, we can get a them. URL and put it in the show notes. Yeah, there's, um, there's also some really great books that they're starting to write about them. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to, I would say focus on um, solve, looking at a problem that you think would be solved and deciding, and I don't know, I don't really know what the best resource is to go to. You, There's well, so are, many. Are you writing about it? Are you speaking about it? I'm speaking about it. Um, I'm, I wish I was blogging more about it. Um, this is good motivation to put some of those resources in a more consolidated format. I've been kind of just flooded with information, so I think yeah. it might be a good time to kind of distill that. So check out my website, timmyreilly.com. Um, I'm sure I'll have something up there soon now that I've been motivated by David. That's right. There are this, yeah. at least a dozen people watching today. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> Tim, right. thanks so much. Thanks, David. This one. I don't know. The, gr the, gr the greatest thing about technology is you make new friends. <laughs> Does that work? <laughs>